Blimey. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like winning the lottery. It's a family piece. It's just been handed down through the family. <clears throat> and it's ended up with us. It's actually Japanese. And it's the class of wear which is popularly called satsuma, uh, which is a, a, a high-fired earthenware with a crackled glaze, and the crazing on it is actually part of it. It's not a defect. Uh, it developed really in response to Japan opening up to the West, which he did uh, in 1853-54. And the Satsuma type wears, uh, one of the great makers was a man called Sobei Kinkazan. He was part of a long uh, family of potters. Now, Kinkazan was interesting because he had this factory turning out this stuff, and if you just went in and bought a piece, then you went away again. If you said, have you got any really good bits? You were taken to his own house and he had a decorating studio attached to his house where all the best stuff was done. So it was a two-tier manufacturing process. This is one of the top pieces. This is a really knockout piece. Um, it's in a form of sort of a tea canister, but I don't think it was ever meant for serious use. On the bottom we would expect to find and indeed have got his mark, Kin Kozan, and then the bottom character is Tsukuru, uh, which means made. Round it, what appears to be just simply decoration, um, but actually, it, in very stylized characters, it says Dai Nihon, which is Great Japan, and then uh, Kyoto. The decoration on here is just breathtaking. <laughs> it is just unbelievable that somebody could take a brush with enamel colours on it and do this extraordinarily detailed painting. Um, the scenes are absolutely typical. We've got a woman and her daughter there. We've got a mountainous landscape. We've got a cockerel perched on a blue rock. We've got a couple of children. Uh, another landscape with figures going up to a sort of um, house in the mountains. And here, which is very nice, a sort of dog-like character, which looks more like a cross between a dog and a cat. Um, the, the sort of grey clouds, which appear to be up here, up close, that's every single dot is painted with the single hair of a brush, and that's actual gold, and that's continued over here. Now, Kinkazan, one of his introductions was this dark blue enamel, which he then gilded. And the problem is with it, the gold doesn't like sticking on it very much and is usually worn off. Here, it's with very slight wear, um, it's still in pristine condition. The nice thing about this one is that some of the panels are actually signed by the painter and you've got at least <laughs> two painters on, uh, on this piece. And this one is one I can read, it says Oshizan. It's, I think, a remarkable find. I mean, it's as good as a piece of satsuma as I've ever seen on the roadshow. Really? Really. Where do you have it at home? Stuck in my husband's office. Whereabouts in his office? I don't like the sound of offices. <laughs> offices sound like crashing <laughs> about telephones, no, no. files no, on, a, on shelf. a shelf. It's safe, is it? Um, well, I thought so. <laughs> I'll put it in a glass cabinet when I get put home. Put it in a glass cabinet when you get home, because it's worth eight to ten thousand pounds. Blimey! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing it in. You have never used this nut? No, I you haven't. You've never wondered what that was for? Well, I have wondered, but I don't know. Well, we just hang the pendulum on. I see. OK. And then this nut unscrews from this back plate. Oh, yes. Okay. And then it goes through there and it screws into the center. So you can lock your pendulum rigid. Now, when you take it home, right. it's not going to shake around. Right, thank you. Thank you. There That's we go. Excellent. You probably know it's a skeleton clock. Yes, I had heard that, actually, yes. And it's very, very typically English. It? About 1860 to 1865. Right. We made 
numerous different models of skeleton clocks. Yes. And this one is actually rather better viewed from behind because you can see the architectural plates working a bit better there. Yes. And you've got three feet to each plate. Yes. So six feet altogether. And the two plates are held in position by these rather nice tapering baluster pillars. Is it made of brass? Because I know it's quite heavy. It is all brass. I see. And never be tempted to clean it. That was my next question. <laughs> right. Now, the reason I say that is because if you have a crack at it, you're going to do damage. I this see. has got to be taken apart professionally by a, a clockmaker and every individual part cleaned, polished, put together, and then it will look absolutely magnificent. Yes. But never be tempted to use any sort of abrasive on it because all that happens is a bit tarnish again. I see. And although the front's slightly faded, you can see that the back has a lovely, lovely grain of rosewood. Yes. It is rosewood. That it is, is rosewood, yes. yes. So there's also provision here for a glass dome. Do you have that or not? I do have a dome. It doesn't uh, fit it properly. It isn't the correct one. I'm afraid it's cracked. But it is under cover. It does it keep is. the dust off. Right. Worth your while having it cleaned. Is it? Yeah. Right. Which wouldn't be too expensive, but have you any idea of a figure? Well, I had it valued with a house clearance. Uh, I belonged to my father, mm -hmm. uh, but when my mother died, um, I had someone to come and have a look, and it was only valued at about 150 pounds. 150? Yes. Well, realistically today, at auction, and I have to say at auction because it's not in retail condition at the moment, no. it would still make close to 1,000 pounds. Really? Yeah. By the time the movement had been cleaned and overhauled and polished and you had a nice dome for it, it would certainly be retailing for in excess of 2,000. Is it really? So... Well, I am surprised. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is excellent. <laughs> very good. Just had enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that just proves that it's got a good tone. Yeah, yes. Um, and what we're looking at is a cornopian. Oh, yes. Because at the date that this was made, uh, that is between about 1830 and 1860, they weren't called cornets, they were called cornopians. I know very little about it, actually, mm. only that it's possibly, uh, or most likely, been handed down through the family uh, and possibly played uh, years and years ago by my uh, wife's grandfather in a Salvation Army Oh, band. it really was in a Salvation oh, yes. Army oh, band. Yes, oh, yes. very good. Yes. Firstly, it's very attractive. I yes. love all this sort of curly cues That's around right. yes, here. Yes. And the next thing is you look a bit closer and you say, hey, there's something a bit dodgy with the valves. The invention of valves to, uh, to get the notes only came in in the 1820s. Mm -hmm. And in 1838, a man called Shaw yes. invented this particular system, yes. His, yes. his system, mm -hmm. which must have worked very well because, um, although finally it's died out now, yes. um, it was actually used for many, many years. Now, have you played both types? Played both types, and, yes. And what do you, yes. what's the difference? How, how do you find this? Well, this is a much slower movement than the piston movement, the valve movement now. Right. Much, much slower. That's interesting. Yes. So probably yes. that then decided the future of the Shaw system. There, there's something that I love about it, mm -hmm. which is that you haven't cleaned it. No, I was going to ask you about that, actually. I mean, there are two schools of thought there, and particularly with uh, an instrument that's used perhaps in public performances, mm. people like to think that, um, you know, a brass wind should be shiny. Shiny and, and clean, but, that's right, yes. But to me, um, I know I bang on about this all the mm. time, something mm. that's old, I think, should look it, and it's got yes. this wonderful patina through yes. here, yes. this yes. golden colouring right, which, yes. which lightens yes. the grey, and I think it's, it's wonderful to see. Mm. Here yes. we have the maker, Kohler, yes. uh, of Henrietta Street, here it is again, right, yes. in London, yes. um, obviously of German yes. extraction. Yes. Yes. The instrument itself is a rarity, mm. and um, cornopians are very desirable. If one was talking about auction value today, we'd yes. be thinking about perhaps between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds. Really? Yeah. Yes, yeah. quite a surprise. Had you had its case, yes. that might have pushed it over 2,000 pounds. Really? Yes. So that yes. does make an enormous yes. difference. Yes. But as it is, it's a wonderful instrument. Yeah, it is a good And course. go on using it. I first saw it at a cycle show in 1952 right. and fell in love with it. It wasn't for sale. Right. And then saw it about two years later outside an Italian cafe with a sign on it, 25 pounds. And I just had Did to have it. Did that seem a lot of money then? It was all I had in the bank. I was saving up to get married and my future in-laws 
didn't think much of that. Right. <laughs> but um, you say 1952 you first saw it. Have you tracked its history any more accurately than that? Well, only that they were made during the war in Italy by two brothers, we, because of, mainly because of the shortage of steel. In fact, it was almost non-existent for bicycle making. And um, one was a ski manufacturer, and the two of them got together and used their expertise to, to make wooden bicycles. It's interesting you should say skis, because, in fact, looking at it, my mind sees about four or five different technologies that went into making this bicycle. Right. Um, you can see skis, as you say, you can see boat building, you can see aircraft building. All aircraft at that time were built of wood up yes, until the, course, yes, uh, the Second right. War. Um, es especially the propeller. Yes. Propellers were all laminated wood. The frame, starting here, coming all the way around, right through this extraordinary bend at the front, coming down the main tube, through the bottom bracket and ending here at the chainstay, um, well, is one piece of wood. That's right. I mean, I've measured it. It's seven foot long if you laid seven it on the ground. Yeah, it blows my mind to think the way this is all bent round and everything and arrives in the right place, you know, for uh, the head and... That's right. Probably they didn't make the handlebars. No, I think handlebars and chain wheel and brakes are probably stock items. Well, stock items, things. but everything else they made in yeah. house, which is quite amazing, I, especially I, as I they're doing it incredible. during the war. Yeah, that's right. But as I say, they were doing it because they wanted to build a bicycle out of wood because they couldn't want to build one out of anything else. Mm. But also they were in tune with developments in cycling at the time, build a lighter, faster, better bicycle. Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, I wonder if they achieved it. Have you ever seen another one of these? I've only seen a frame on its own um, with no forks. Um, and I, I have a feeling not many of these survive because of the weakness of the forks. If somebody you think the forks are the weak point? Yeah. Right. I don't know how we're going to compare a value because I don't think there's another one of these around in this condition. I think a bare minimum of two to three thousand pounds really? for this bicycle. Yes. I think it yeah. is so rare and in such wonderful condition. Yeah. Could I indulge myself, please, and go for a spin? Yes, please do. Thank Sorry. you. My wife had it for, I don't know, five, six years. It's probably come down through the family. She was quite happily wearing it as a bit of costume jewellery. Bit of costume jewellery? Yeah. And um, what did she wear it on? Denim jackets. Denim jackets. Anything that she thought, nice sparkly mm. thing. And then we took it to a jeweller's in Chancery Lane to get the clasp sort of repaired a little bit. Mm -hmm. And he turned around and said, you do realise it's the real thing? The yeah. real thing. And so, so she's not turned... worn it since, more as the pity. Diamonds and denim. Yes, She exactly. really thought a bit about the design. I, I did notice that the two ends unscrewed, but that was... Mm. Well, they unscrew because there was probably not only this brooch, but a cascade of them running the front of a, a lady's fiercely corseted dress in about 1900. So you think your wife had problems. Think of um, Princess Yusupova walking around with this. Not bad, is it? No, not bad at all. Not bad. Now, I say Princess Yusupova because I can tell that this is a Russian brooch by the safety clasp. There's a strange little sort of twist like a question mark at the end, which is a brilliant device because it stops the owner pricking her finger, or more accurately, her lady's maid pricking her finger because you've never put this sort of thing on, your, on yourself in pre-revolutionary Russia. What we call a stomacher because it runs along the front of the stomach of, of such a lady at a... I can't think how it could have been more beautiful. Why, what's, what's the look? And just underneath here, there's a, a, a break in, in, in the design, which I think is where the second and third and I don't know how many more brooches went down to meet it. Um, a, a, a tiny little groove here. And also observe the beauty of this gallery here, the Pierce mm. Gallery, and the fact that the back of the brooch is made of gold and yet the front is of platinum to give the whiteness of the effect. I think it's probably quite a late brooch. It's 20th century. The Russians, it's a curiously sort of feudal um, life they were living there, and in the early 20th century, things couldn't be more sumptuous and more bejeweled and more exotic, really. So this is a fantastic context, really, isn't it? I'm just going to look a little bit for hallmarks. Russian hallmarks almost always appear um, on, on the clasp of them. Um, of the jewel and along the pin, which is strange, and yet there are more here. And it's jolly good that I did check that, actually, because there are the initials of the maker there, Fyodor Laurier, who is a very well-known Art Nouveau jeweler, making things in the manner of Lalique, um, serpents and butterflies and that sort of thing. So this is a slightly conventional one for him, but a very beautiful one. Now, what did the jewellers um, have to say about it? They must have admired it very much, I think, didn't they? Well, they did, yes. Mm. They said it was a, a lovely piece and 
Yeah. And uh, he even turned around and said, I'll give you 5,000 scrap for it. I said, no. 5,000 scrap? <laughs> I said, no, well, I don't think so. No, no, well, I think scrapping it's not the right word. Exactly. I think we really, we've gone beyond exactly. scrap. No, yet. it's now too we, beautiful for someone to break down. fabulous context. Well, you know, if he's going to offer you £5,000 scrap for it, double it up for insurance. £10,000 for insurance, yeah. Dear me. I think one has it a guess. A terrier, possibly a wire fox terrier. Right. What do you think? I'm not very good on dogs, I'm afraid. We yes. just we call him Arthur at home because... Arthur. Arthur Wardle, the signature here, is one of the best artists working at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. He paints his dogs with such vitality and personality that he's almost ready to kind of spring right out of the yes. string right out of the painting and I'm sure that's why people absolutely love his work. If you look at the quite detailed and partly this rather heavy impasto but this building up of a paint surface of the dog in contrast to the background thinly painted what it actually does is it throws the head and the portrait of the dog forward, giving yes. him that extra kind of uh, uh, kind of personality and yes. the poignancy. It just looks like he's just jumped up, like someone was called to him, and he's just jumped up. He looks so real the way he kind of stands forward there from the from the yeah. back. Now he was considered a kind of value for Arthur. Is that what he's called? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And why Arthur? Before well, we... just because of the artist's name. I mean, oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't get that. I thought there was some other family connection. No reason, no. no, no. Just we didn't know his name. But coming back to this question of the price, I think probably the value is in the region of four to six thousand pounds. He's always been one of the family, really. So. Yes. <laughs> and what you've got here is a pilot's watch. Pilot's watch. A pilot's watch. Yes. In fact, if you actually put it, it's somewhat large yeah. for everyday yeah. wear. And they were worn outside, probably on a big leather or fleece flying jackets yes, right. and you wore them yeah. with a long strap actually outside so you yeah. could read it when you're in the cockpit yeah. and it's the date of this one uh, we'll see inside there should be the marks of Omega the manufacturer the numbers but there's also the import hallmarks yeah and the letter R which I think is 1912 yeah so basically it's a first world war pilot's watch yeah and hence the the very clear white dial with the black numbers have you had this valued um, well, tell me where you got it, actually. It's quite well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I got it. I bought it of a chap that was dealing in bric-a-brac in Newport Market in South Wales some um, 20 years ago, 22 mm -hmm. years ago. And there was trouble with the watch. It wasn't keeping time. It was stopping. So he said, if you let me have it back, he said, I know a man that can get it fixed, but you'll have to pay. What did you pay him? Um, oh, what is it? it was 70 or 80 pounds, and I think I gave him about a tenner to get it fixed, which was a lot that's, of money. That's a lot of money. Yeah. 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as a watch, it's probably worth, in fact, more like a couple of thousand or so. Yeah. But this is a repair bill. Yeah. Yeah. 1933. Yeah. Made out to a T.E. Shaw of Clouds Hill, Morriton and Dorset. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Do you know who he is? No, I haven't got a clue. It's Lawrence of Arabia. Good God. If I'm correct. Yeah. After the First World War, yeah. he was a somewhat of a complex character, mm. and he rejoined, I think, didn't he rejoin the RAF under the name of Shaw? Yeah. And I think he was killed under the name of Shaw on his motorcycle when dressed in RAF Good kit. God. To be honest, to be perfectly honest with you, I always thought he was a fiction of car um, a character of fiction, I did. No, no, no. no. It's the, it's the T.E. Lawrence of... Well, as oh, you say, of the marvellous film, yeah, well, and he wrote the, the book. Yeah, I remember seeing the film years and years ago. But, um, but I reckon that, and he lived, I'm sure. Yeah, my recollection is he lived at Clouds Hill yeah. in Dorset. Good God. And it's actually his watch, probably returned to him in 1930, having been cleaned, under the name, the pseudonym that he'd adopted. Good God. So. Yeah. A um, couple of grand, a couple of half grand, as just as a watch. Yeah. How much you could add for the Lawrence connection, I don't know. He's one of the most fascinating characters of the early part of this century. Yeah. I would... It, it's a guess. I'd double that, maybe yeah. five, maybe ten. Good God. I'd better get it in short. <laughs> yeah. If there's one thing that everybody thinks about when they think of Rolls-Royce, it's the spirit of ecstasy. This, I suppose, vision of ethereal beauty. It's a wonderful bronze. The uh, original was designed by 
uh, Charles Sykes in uh, 1911, mm -hmm. which is when the, uh, the first spirit of uh, ecstasy, of course a much smaller version than this, yes. was first put on a Rolls Royce. Interestingly enough, actually, it was an optional extra to begin with. She's commonly believed uh, to be Eleanor Thornton, right. who was Charles Sykes' favourite model. Yes. Where did you get her from? We bought it at an auction in New Jersey. We lived there for five years, and we bought it in 1987. Mm -hmm. It was an auction of Chinese things, mostly, but this was one odd item there, which we spotted. It was not listed as the spirit of ecstasy. It wasn't. It mm -hmm. was just a bronze figure. Well, she certainly we caught the it. eye. I mean, you couldn't really av avoid seeing her, could you? Not at all. But very few people at the auction, actually. Mm. <laughs> Your lucky day. Yes, it was. Okay. What did you pay for it, as a matter of interest? We... About $800. $800. Mm. 1988. That yeah. was about 87. 400 pounds. Yeah, OK. Well, it's, it's a wonderful bronze figure. Uh, bronze figures of this size were actually used by Rolls-Royce uh, for their main showrooms, mm -hmm. uh, as a showroom model, if you like. Rolls-Royce, I believe, um, only know of about nine or ten of these models. But the interesting thing here is this particular one is numbered, what is that number? 28. 20, 28. 28. 28. Um, so it may well be that there were more than nine or ten actually made. Mm -hmm. I, I think the records were lost during the war. The only other thing is that there are a tremendous number of facsimiles around not just of bronze, which, which this is, and you can, you can hear it, but also of plaster, coloured to look like bronze. Yes. Um, it's very difficult to know, without a really good provenance, whether this is an original that was made specifically for one of the Rolls-Royce franchises, or whether this is a, a later casting. Mm. The only thing I would say is, if you look at the base here, this black marble base, it's actually quite unusual to find these with a rectangular base because all of the, um, the later castings I've seen are on circular bases. So this is quite a good plus point, I have to say. Um, so you can't just discount that, just discount it. What about value? The facsimiles, um, the, the, the later castings, are not worth a huge amount of money. And they can fetch anywhere between eight and 1,200 pounds. If we were able to prove that this was absolutely genuine, that it came out of a dealer's showroom, then the likelihood is it could be worth eight to 10,000 pounds. Wow. <laughs> so it may well pay you yes. to do a little bit of poking about, a little bit of research. It might be worth a trip back to the States to find out. Well, you know, I think it could be. I think when you first look at this um, plaque, you think it's a piece of costume jewellery because of its shape and style. Um, is that something that you thought of? Or? Well, I was 15 when I got it. Um, it came in a rather untidy box, just of bits and bobs from my auntie. I just liked it, so I kept it safe and well, occasionally wore it. I think it's, it's good that you kept it safe um, because it does have a value and it's quite a, a piece um, that you could date quite precisely because of its design and style. Now, first of all, this material that looks a bit like a cloud formation mm. or a snail shell, um, which you might think is just glass, is actually rock crystal. So it's a natural cris yes, yes. crystal form. Um, the, this, this flash of colour in the centre is actually a line of fine Burmese rubies. Mm -hmm. And then the white stones on the borders of the rubies are, of course, lovely diamonds. Mm -hmm. So you've got a complete mixture of precious stones mm -hmm. in a natural looking hard stone rock crystal border. Mm -hmm. Now its shape is a bit peculiar because it doesn't look very much like, well, would you wear it as a brooch? Would you wear it? How would you wear it? And then you, you turn it round and the explanation is there because it is a lapel clip. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen that if you, just there, above that little space, mm -hmm. there is a word. Have you ever seen that word I, I've before? looked at it and it says Chaume. Chaume, exactly, mm -hmm. because Chaume were a firm of manufacturers making jewellery, particularly very fine pieces in the 30s, and they used to make jewellery that had 
a tremendously pronounced style. Mm. Now, the firm itself actually goes back way into about ooh, 200 years old, something like mm. that, mm -hmm. and they were patronised by Napoleon, and they go back a long way, and some of their jewellery makes a great deal of money. Mm. Um, this clip, although it's a fairly modest piece, mm. really, it's not got a big flash of diamonds, it's not what big chunky stones, mm. but because of its singularity, the fact that it's signed, show me, made in France, mm. And smothered all over the bottom of this clip are the little French control marks. So it's got all the right things what there is that the we metal? look for. Platinum. Platinum. Mm. It's not white gold, all it right. would be platinum. The Burmese rubies in the centre and the quality of the brilliance flanking the rubies themselves do make it quite valuable. Mm -hmm. So I think if it was sold in an auction, we're looking at something in the realms of £2,000 for really? it. Well, it's wonderful to be here in the Victoria and Albert Museum, but I never expected that we'd actually get brought in a museum quality picture. But that's what you've brought. It is fantastic oh, wow. quality. It really is. Just look at the way he has handled the whole light in this market scene. The way the, the, the light comes off the candle and illuminates her face. It's the most brilliant piece of work. And you've got, you've got the... Um, source of light here, then you've got another candle light here, and tremendously subtle lighting in... Look at the reflections on this copper jug, wonderfully handled, and the way these... Um, this boy and this young man are conversing, he's looking at him, but she's, he's looking across at her. Wonderful little narrative details yeah. in this overall scene. Has it been in your family for some time? It was in my husband's family right and uh, I think his father bought it uh, many years ago was there any particular significance to the subject do you think for your father-in-law when he bought it well he worked in the fish market as a young boy Did he? and his father was uh, in the fish market uh, before him and so I imagine that because it's a market scene that's what appealed him, Absolutely. but I don't know, really. But uh, also the fact that it's uh, on the quayside. Yes. With, uh, there probably is fish being sold somewhere in the distance here. I would guess so. And the, the, the sort of moonlit nighttime markets would have been something that he would have remembered. He had a good eye for paintings. He certainly did. And uh, I think I had a good eye, because when they uh, split the house up, when the parents-in-law died, this was the one thing that I really loved. It's a very good and choice you made. A very it. good choice. Yeah. I mean, there's so much more when you get into it. Um, there's, there's this wonderful moonlight at the top of the picture. Again, sort of uh, illuminating the silhouettes of the buildings and the rigging of the ships behind. Because oh, they're rigging. I didn't know rigging, what they were. rigging of sailing vessels. Yes, of course. Incredibly of course. beautifully handled. Yeah. Very subtle. Mm. And then to reveal all down at the bottom mm. is the signature here. Yes. P. Van Schendel. Yes. Petrus Van Schendel. Uh, a Dutch painter, but he worked in Belgium and um, Holland, and he absolutely specialised in these moonlit, candlelit scenes. He was, it was his trademark, if you like. It was what he was absolutely brilliant at. And he was working in the middle of the 19th century, between about 1830 and 1870. was... Um, when he was really in his prime, painted in oil on this very nice bit of wood. Well, just quality is the word for it. It is by probably the leading um, candlelight painter of the 19th century. That I didn't know. I did see, I did see some of Van Schendel's paintings in New York. Yes. Uh, two, three years ago. Yeah. Perhaps five years ago. Yeah, no, well, he's, mm. he's, his work does come up mm. quite regularly <laughs> at auction. Uh, so we know reasonably clearly what this probably would make. Um, I think at auction now, uh, he's very much in vogue, he's very much sought after. A lot of people collect him. Probably make between 70 and 90,000 pounds. So you should probably insure it for 100,000 pounds. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like winning the lottery. Almost. 100,000 pounds for insurance.